Welcome to Conversations in a Vintage Shop, a podcast from behind my counter between customers. Join me while I sit behind my retail counter and just have a conversation with you or with myself. While I look out the window, observe what I see, things that are happening in the store today, throughout the week, and just fun little stories that I have from my time as a business owner. This is something that you find interesting, then keep listening, and I appreciate you. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening in to episode 8 of Conversations in a Vintage Shop a podcast where I bring the conversations I have in my vintage shop with my customers and my friends right to you. And today I'm excited because this is going to be our first interview episode. And our first interviewee will be my amazing life partner, Mr. Charles Sterling, the fantastic artist behind at Bonejack Designs and at Mr. Pen and Marker, and most notably, a fan favorite on my Instagram with some of my awkward Instagram videos. Most recently, a video we did in response to comments we get about some of our handmade clothing in our shop. And for those of you who have not seen it, head on over to our Instagram at Carmine and Hayworth, and you might have to scroll down a little bit. But when I do videos for my Instagram, Normally, as with a lot of these podcast episodes, I'm doing it in response to things I've been thinking about that day or things that have irked me. (laughs) And this one was a direct response to some comments that I get every now and often in the shop about pieces that I get from small businesses who make it. They're made to order. They don't produce bulk massive amounts. And you know, sometimes prices are just going to be a little bit higher. And that can range anywhere because of the labor that goes into it, the materials, if they're ethically made, sustainably sourced, a lot of different factors. And when I get customers coming in, looking at a beautiful handmade dress that is made of the best material, it's a small business made in the U.S., and I get people bulking at the price, it it gets on my nerves a bit. So we did a fun little video in response to it. And you know what, you guys? It's the reason why we're called small businesses. We're not JCPenney's. We're not Sears, Target. We don't get things in huge mass quantities, which I love personally. Some people may not. But if that's something that interests you, head on over there. Again, Charles is a fan favorite because he's extremely awkward, but stay tuned. We will hop right into our interview with him. And by interview, I mean just us hanging out and talking. (laughs) So if that's something you actually want to listen to, stay tuned. Now, I just want to go over some things that have been happening in the shop recently. I like giving these little updates in case some of you haven't made it in or haven't been keeping up with us on social media, but I am recording this on Sunday, November 28th, after Thanksgiving, after Black Friday, after Small Business Saturday, and it was a really crazy past couple of days. You know, we have all had a crazy past year or two. And you never know how each day is going to be. And especially when it comes to events like Small Business Saturday, you don't know what to expect. And I have to say, the Carmine and Hayworth community came out and really kicked my butt and gave me a run for my money. (laughs) It was so much fun over this past weekend. And those of you who are listening who stopped out, thank you so much. And to those of you who didn't stop out, but I see all the time anyways, thank you for always supporting small businesses, especially my humble little shop here. It's greatly appreciated. But I turn it back to 
just some things that I experienced, especially on Black Friday and kind of a crossover into Small Business Saturday and just that I got kind of a kick out of. And I know a lot of small businesses can say the same thing. We've all had this happen. But in our downtown Fargo area, you've got a mix of shops that I call kind of like the mall shops where you get the mall crowd. You've got a lot of the very basic traditional Midwestern wear, but then you have a lot of the more artsier shops. Uh, I just used that wrong. I'm an English major. Jeez, the artsier shops, not more artsier. You guys, I'm suffering today. I haven't had any caffeine, so please bear with me. (laughs) But you get a lot of people that are used to going to big box retailers, the mall, where you get tons of sales. You know, they're used to treating the salespeople like crap. And some of that carries over to us small businesses. And the good thing about it is we don't have to put up with it. I, I mean, I could fire myself if I have an attitude problem, but I won't. But you get customers who try to get sales when there are none or look at your products and go, well, I can just get this cheaper online. No, ma'am, I'm sorry you cannot. Unless this artist has a huge Amazon store that they are not aware of. But let it be a lesson. If you're one of those people where you don't go to small businesses that often, you're a mall shopper, you love your Target, which I get it. I like Target. Don't bring those same practices into small businesses. It's a huge faux pas. We're a call to small business for a reason. We can't afford to do half-off sales We can't afford to have week, month-long sales. Just be kind. You should just be kind no matter where you go. I don't care if it's a big box store or not. Just don't be a jerk. And for the most part, everybody was amazing. But you still get the few sprinkled in there that kind of treat you like you're a worker at Walmart. They feel like for some reason they can talk to you however they want and they can spew their negativity and you're not going to say anything back. And I'm here to tell you, my friends, if you do that in my shop, I will speak back to you. And I will embarrass you. (laughs) I have no shame. You're in my space. Therefore, I can talk back to you if I want to. So yeah, that's been the week so far. It's been pretty uneventful. I have no new ghost updates. I thought I caught a ghost on my security system this past week, but it ended up being a camera glitch. So I was really excited because I was going to share it with you all today. But it turned out to be nothing. And I debunked it, which is okay. (laughs) You know, this time of year, I tell you, I am struggling trying to keep my creative side up. Even coming up with topics for this podcast has been a real struggle. You know, balancing home life and being at the shop six days a week and trying to get everything ready for the holidays I tell you, my brain capacity is just shrinking by the day. So we'll see. We'll see how things go. And I may have a new episode next week. I may not. We'll see. But for sure, once January hits, once I can recover and kind of fill my cup a bit, I'm hoping I'll have a lot more fresh content for you. (laughs) But today I'm really excited. I get to chat with my best friend and life partner and... Really, we're just kind of shooting the shit, talking about things that have been on our minds. Some of these topics may upset some of you. We have our strong opinions on things, especially in the world of small business, especially in our particular area and trends and things that we are seeing. And again, it might just come off as us ranting, but I feel like this is the time of year, get it out of your system and start the new year fresh and with the whole fresh mindset. So if you want to hear us old folks talk and complain about things for the second episode in a row, (laughs) then keep listening. It is the moment you all have been waiting for. My very first interview with my incredible life partner, Mr. Charles Sterling. 
And when I introduce him, I never quite know how to describe him. We've been together longer than just an average boyfriend-girlfriend situation. We're not married. North Dakota doesn't have common law. And sometimes when I say partner, life partner, people are expecting me to introduce a woman. They think I'm a lesbian. I am not. I just have a Charles. For those who have been lucky enough to meet Charles when he has begrudgingly worked in my shop on days that I have to step away, you may see him as the quiet gentleman behind the counter, awkwardly sitting there, wishing he could go home. And also, you may recognize him from some of my recent Instagram videos. He's become the new star of the show, and I think he might be my new mascot. Not only is he my favorite person, but he is an artist, a hockey player, and most importantly, he's a Canadian. How are you today, Charles? Tired. That's deep. <laughs> We're also sharing one microphone. <laughs> so this is going to come off as like actual like an actual interview. So Charles, when I asked you to be my first interview on my podcast today, what was your initial reaction? I was thrilled. Do you ever give any answers that are more than three words? No. Is this how the whole podcast is going to be today? I don't know. I'm just kind of doing a stick right now. I don't know. (laughs) I really should be videotaping it, this, because we are actually not doing this interview at my shop today. We are at home, sitting on our couch with our four cats surrounding us and our PJs. I don't have any makeup on. Charles just got a haircut. Charles, why did you just get a haircut? Because I had tennis ball head. And why did you have tennis ball head? Because I had a series of pandemic haircuts that then ended kind of badly. Who was the moron that gave you these set haircuts? Well, I asked for it, but you're the one who actually committed them. And that's why you should never let me touch hair. Anywho, enough about that. So, all of you who have seen the recent Instagram videos that Charles has been in, I like to incorporate him in things I'm doing in the shop because I get sick of seeing myself and I'm sure other people get sick of seeing me too. So it's nice to just throw another human into the mix. And our most recent Instagram video was in response to some comments I have been getting in the shop about some handmade clothing. And one thing that I know Charles will agree with is I feel very strongly about topics involving makers, especially those in the garment and clothing industry. So when I had some people make comments about the price of some handmade dresses in our shop, I thought, well, the perfect opportunity to educate people would be just to do a fun little video. So, Charles, when I ask you to do these videos, what is your initial reaction? (laughs) Usually it's, I'm, I'm tired. I think we've established that you're tired. You're always tired. So when I talk to you about doing this short little video in response to comments made about some of the clothing in the shop, what did you think about that? What went through your head when I've been telling you all of these stories about what people have been saying? Well, I spent a decade working in big box retail. I won't tell you whose big box I was working in. It was Macy's. (laughs) That's a closely guarded secret that's out now i guess but anyway i i so i've seen where companies will large companies will buy merchandise for pennies essentially and mark them up to such a great extent that they can then sell them in springtime for a dollar fifty and still actually make a profit so i mean you don't sell clothing like that 
but people somehow believe that a small business can charge the same amount for things that a massive retailer will. And nine times out of 10, the massive retailer is selling clothes that are made cheaply by five-year-olds in Bangladesh, whereas you're trying to sell uh, ethically made stuff by people uh, you know, in the U.S. or the U.K. or um, not some country where they're paying you know, five cents for a T-shirt made by a child, literally. So, All right. We just had to pause for a minute while we prevented World War III from breaking out in our house between our four cats. And we'll get into the dynamic of that in a little bit. But that's something that we talk about a lot at the shop, especially when you're in the shop with me. It's a good chance for me to kind of vent about some of the retail problems I've had because you've seen them 10 times worse working at the place that I shall not name again. So do you think people, the disconnect between how people view small businesses and big corporate retail, where do you think that disconnect comes from? I think it's ignorance or they just don't, they just don't think. I mean, you can't really believe that a small store can buy something for 19 cents and then sell it to you for $9 because forever 21 does the same thing. I think it's just ignorance or people don't really want to know where this stuff comes from. Like if you are an animal lover and like I am and you eat hamburger, I don't want to know where that hamburger hamburger comes from. Uh, I just know that I like hamburger, but I don't want to see the process. I think it's a similar thing like that. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like instead of, you know, just lashing out at people who say that, I think it's good to kind of create these little videos and have a little bit of humor behind it. But I also think it kind of pushes that message a a little bit further. But that's one of the conversations we have a lot lately. And it's a struggle trying to get people to understand where we're coming from because it's impossible to know what we see and the process we go through. If you're not a small business owner or you haven't worked in retail before and you've worked at the mall, I worked at the mall for numerous jobs since I was in high school up until right before I started my shop. And you get these reminders every day about just how far that disconnect is. Going back to the corporate retail side of it, anyone who's been in my shop and has seen especially our men's section and the way it's merchandised, I get a lot of compliments on that. And I will tell everybody, that is not me. I cannot take the credit because Charles is a master merchandiser from his time working in corporate retail. Now, This is something that I think a lot of us who have worked in the service industry or big box retail knows, and that is working corporate retail is hell on earth (laughs) from customers to the work schedules, especially, you know, we just got done with one of our first holidays. And I think both of us have, that was my phone going off. Both of us have kind of PTSD from working big box retail during the holidays. So Charles, do you have any horror stories from working at Macy's during the holidays that stick out in your head that you wish you could just pluck out of your brain and never think of again? Pretty much every Thanksgiving that I missed with my family uh, because I had to stay in town because if you were a full-time person, you obviously had to work those days the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, And it started out where it would be at about 6 a.m. They would open. And then I think the next year it was five and then went down to 4.30 and then two. And then one year I remember it was 10 p.m. on Thanksgiving. And then I think the same year they stayed open 24 hours. So I remember sitting in the mall with a little like packed lunch that I had eating at like 6am after working from 10am and I was on a break. And then I think I had to work until 8pm or something. Uh, but those were ridiculous. 
And when I started out the first year, I think I was making $7.60 an hour. So that wasn't really uh, motivating financially for me. I could have probably done anything that would have made me more money than that. By the end of it, I was a commission employee. So at least there was a little bit of a silver lining there where I would make a, a bit more money because it was so busy. Uh, but those are, that's time you never get back. That's what, 10 years that you don't really get back of family holidays or cause I miss Christmas too, usually. So, or I would have a very short Christmas. Um, but that's something that, uh, I think I would probably do over again if I could. Now I'm a couple weeks ago, we did an episode on customer stories and mine, some of them are funny, but most of them were pretty scary. So let's lighten it up a little bit. Now, is there a customer that you remember from your time at that dreaded big box retailer that sticks out for you all these years later? There was one girl who I think she lived around the mall. Uh, she would come in probably two or three times a week. She wasn't really a shopper. She was just more kind of a person who would walk through, but she would always stop you if you were doing something and call you sir. She'd start the conversation with sir. And then she'd ask if you'd seen the recent movie or something like that. Um, she wasn't mean by any means. It was just somebody who would kind of take up some time when you could be trying to sell something to somebody. And so it was kind of uh, annoying because if you were a commission person, you were just trying to get, you know, to a customer to try to sell them something so you could take home a little bit of extra money. Now, I remember you telling me about Sir when we first started dating and you lived in an apartment kind of close to the mall in the vicinity of the mall with a roommate. And you said that Sir actually lived on your floor, right? Yeah, she was uh, at the other end of the building. So it was a pretty small building with, I think there were maybe six apartments, kind of three on each side. And she lived at the furthest one on the other end. It was a kind of a slummy apartment building. After years of living downtown, I had tried to move back to a lower income level type apartment where I could afford it better. And uh, it was a pretty crappy building. But she lived there with her. I think it must have been her mom and maybe uncle. I'm not sure if it was her father or not, but uh, she lived on our floor. Well, I remember one time I had spent the night at your apartment and I think this was during some kind of blizzard or ice storm and all the electricity in the entire building went out around the city. And what was it? Our cat Dante had gone up to the door and started meowing or how, how did this come about? I think the, yeah, the electricity went out and the, the heat in the building was electric as well. So that meant that we didn't have any heat. And, uh, I'm not sure why she was knocking on doors. Uh, but Dante, he is such a personable kitty. He loves people and he heard her outside the door and she was, you know, asking if anybody was in there and we didn't know what to do. So we were just staying quiet because we didn't really want a conversation because we weren't sure why she was knocking on doors. And uh, suddenly Dante meows and we hear there's a kitty in there. And then so she just stayed probably five or 10 minutes standing outside the door waiting for one of us to open the door, I guess. And Dante just kept sitting there meowing. I think he even like tried to stick his paw under the door. <laughs> I remember vividly. We had, I, I don't know if we had a flashlight on in your your room, but it was me, you, and your roommate in your room panicking on what we should do because in general, none of us like opening doors. We don't like talking on the phone. We don't like opening doors for people. We don't like answering the door. So I just remember all three of us just sitting there panicking, not knowing what to do. Not like we're adults or anything, but... That, that sticks out to me because that was my first experience with Sir. 
But being that she was at your door knocking during a power outage and it was pitch black, I have to say that was kind of odd. Well, and she knew uh, my roommate, too, because he worked in the mall, too. So she knew all of us. Well, except for you. But uh, and and <laughs> I think the thing why we were more apprehensive was she she would do some sort of kind of strange things like. I remember she had this rash on her arm one time and she showed it to me and then she kept scratching it and like asking me what I thought it was. And I mean, that's not really an interaction you want to have with somebody. Um, So I I think we were kind of a little bit afraid that that next interaction would go kind of that way. Yeah, it, it was bizarre for sure, but I guess it makes a good story. Now, I know there are a lot of people listening that probably don't really know that much about you other than maybe what I tell them or what we talk about in the store. But one thing I really love to share is I consider you quite an amazing artist and you're really, really great at doing a lot of hockey illustrations, mid-century illustrations, pet illustrations. I mean, you do a lot and some of your pieces are even in my shop. So is this, is that something that you've always wanted to do or have you always been drawing? Yeah, I've been drawing since I was a kid, just really not very well, but I I kept drawing, you know, through high, high school and, uh, I kind of stopped, I think probably once I got into college, but I, all through high school, my notebooks and stuff were covered in cartoon goalies. I was always drawing goalies no matter what class it was, whether I was interested in the class or not. It would just be covered. My notebook would be covered in goalies. Um, so that's probably why I do hockey stuff now. Uh, so it's something I've done always. It's just I never really took it very seriously until the last couple of years and it's probably not a good thing that I took it seriously. Do you like hockey because you're Canadian? Yeah, it's legally mandated. That's what I thought. Now, one thing that I have seen as you have gotten deeper and deeper into your illustrations and becoming almost like a freelance artist, you've been commissioned to do a lot of portraits, um, uh, just a lot of amazing things. You even designed work for a clothing tag. Was it in Spain? Oh yeah, uh, my it's a jacket and tie illustration that's on a clothing tag uh, by the company Curzon Classics from Spain. It's kind of like English um, English heritage type clothing. So if you kind of think of like what fancy wealthy english people would wear on a sunday it's that type of clothing um so that's kind of neat that's that's one thing i kind of forget because i did that a couple years ago but that's that's probably the biggest accomplishment honestly one thing i'm always curious about and i i've talked about this before that when i talk to people about them starting a small business i don't want to hear about all of the good things that have happened i mean that's great But I know I personally learn from the not so great things that have happened. And I can imagine as an artist, I know I've heard a lot of horror stories from other artist friends about work getting stolen or not getting paid for jobs. Have any of those things happened to you? And I know they have, but for everybody out there, what have been the ones that stick out to you the most? Well, when I first started drawing, it was mainly clothing and fashion stuff that I was doing. And that was, it was just an Instagram profile basically that I started and I would get contacted from time to time to, to do stuff. But at that point I really didn't have a lot of confidence in what I was doing, which I still honestly don't have a ton of confidence in what I'm doing, but uh, this company, which is a pretty large company out of New York that makes clothing for men who are shorter in stature like myself. So that's why I really thought it was a neat thing. 
wanted me to do a couple of size charts for them with uh, a couple of other illustrations thrown in. And I remember I did a couple of the drawings and I sent it back to them. And the guy got back to me saying they wanted some changes and, you know, this is a good sort of rough draft. And, and I thought, okay, well, yeah, that's fine. And then he wanted to call, like set up a call so that they could kind of explain more what they were, they were doing. And like, I work a 40 hour a week job and they wanted to call at a certain time on a certain day. And I said, well, you know, I can't really do that because I'm at work at that point. And this was obviously before everybody's working from home like I do now. So I couldn't even kind of ask for a little bit of time off to come home and do that. I would have had to sit there in my car trying to go through a conference call from these guys in New York, which would have been kind of surreal. So I got back to him and I said, well, let's, if we can set up a different time, you know, I'll gladly take some time off from my 40 hour week job. And then I just never heard anything back from them. And so I thought, okay, well, that's a little bit of an FU, but that's fine. I was kind of not super confident in what I was going to do for them and how it was going to turn out anyway. Um, so that that's probably the first one. And then uh, I had, when I first started drawing the hockey things, I had a guy want a couple of drawings and I did two sort of portraits of him and I had sent them back to him. And usually the way that I'll, I'll work is I don't want any payment up front because that's more I don't want to take take money from somebody and then somehow end up not doing it on time or whatever it just it's less stressful if I if money doesn't change hands until the actual work is completed so I had sent this guy the completed work and then I sent him an invoice and then I got something saying that he would pay me at such and such a date and then he never paid me and so I sent him a second invoice and then at that point I think he may have sent a reply And then I think I sent him a third one. And then finally, he just never sent me the money. So um, that one sticks out just because I I think uh, it made me sort of change the way I do things a little bit. But um, and then the the third one that stands out was a local business who I had done some work for. And I wasn't wanting very much money at all. because as I preface this with, I don't have a ton of confidence in what I'm doing. So I don't charge a ton of money for my stuff, which is maybe not good, but that's a personality thing, I guess. Uh, but so we agreed on a price and I had a couple meetings with them and I had probably spent, I don't know, probably 10 hours just doing different things that I thought they might like. And then finally sort of agreed on one that they liked. And I finished that and it looked pretty good. And then, um, you know, they took it and they used it how they were using it. Um, and then I never got payment and I talked to them again and they said, well, the check's in the mail and the check was not in the mail. So I never got payment. And that, that's probably the worst one. Cause that's a local company who, uh, the, the product that it went on to, I actually bought and Courtney's mom and dad bought some too. So we ended up for that artwork that I did, I, it ended up costing money and, uh, was really kind of a big F you since it was a local person that just seems even worse. So, I mean, those are probably the, the main ones as far as, uh, bad things that have happened. I guess there are a couple other ones where projects just have kind of fallen through or, or just never happened really. So that's the hard thing is you kind of get your hopes up for certain stuff and you think it's going to, make a big impact or it's actually going to work. And, and then it just ends up not, not happening. I had one with some, uh, pretty high level, uh, USA hockey guy who wanted some work done that I ended up doing some work for, but then with the the pandemic kind of hit right at the worst time for that. And then the project just basically fell through, but, uh, that one was kind of maybe the most disappointing one. Yeah. Well, and, and going back to that, that work with a local business, that's one that always kind of stuck out in my mind for, for so many different reasons. And the fact that the work you did was for a product that was used not just for one year, but for two years in a row. And they actually ended up altering your, your artwork too, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they. I think they took part of the 
part of the picture off or part of the word the word mark that I on there had on there off. Um, I mean, the way it works is ordinarily if they if they buy the piece of art from me, they can use it however they want. So that wouldn't have been a problem really if they'd used it a second year in a row, but just mainly because they didn't pay me for the first year. So they got more use out of it um, without paying for it. So they essentially stole that. But um, I don't really have a big problem with them taking the word mark off of it necessarily. It's just more the money that didn't change hands. Yeah. And things like that always just kind of leave a, a bad taste in my mouth. And also they were super awkward about it too. And trying to, get them to pay or even acknowledge that they haven't. But then even just recently, we found out that you weren't the only artist that they had done that to. But, you know, it comes into Fargo. Oh, one of our cats is being a little naughty. Uh, Fargo is, it's, again, the biggest city in North Dakota, but it's still a small city. And when things like that happen, a lot of times especially in this case, artists, they don't feel like they can really speak up about it. And that's with a lot of issues that happen in our area. If you see something happening that's not right, not ethical, wrong, there's not really a good chance for people to step up and kind of air out their grievances or or call out certain businesses or people for doing this. So, I mean, I I know there are probably other artists out there listening who have had the exact same experience. And I know if this had happened to me, I, I mean, I'm still spitting nails about it and it didn't directly happen to me. So how did you get through that? I mean, like you said, it was really, I mean, I've told some of my friends who are artists how much you had charged for this piece of artwork that took you a while. You did a lot of changes. Like you said, you had a lot of meetings. They were never really clear on what they wanted, but when you would draw something, oh, that's not what we want, and this whole back and forth. And when I tell people that and how much you actually quoted them, a lot of my artist friends are just flabbergasted that them not paying you was an issue for the small, small chunk of money that you had asked for it. So how have you gotten past that? If you have, how? (laughs) Because people like me would never, I mean, I still can't let it go. I hold grudges. So how, how do you get through that? Well, it's not really a business that I went to before or go to now. So if maybe it was something, if it was my favorite place to go and then I kind of got screwed over by them, it would have been hard. Um, I don't necessarily care anymore. Uh, I, I honestly, I, it's, it's too much to worry about stuff like that for me. So I just let it go, which is probably not great because then people tend to step over you, but, uh, there's just no point in worrying about it anymore. I know you're the kind of person that you are really even tempered on things and, you tend to just go with the flow and you don't let things rattle you very much, which is something that I always strive for. And I do have to say, temperament wise, why we're so different is I am 32. How old are you? Do you want me to answer that? Yes. 41. So because of that vast, humongous, crazy age difference, I mean, because when you were 32. I wasn't even born yet. I mean, that's the joke, right? Anyways, you have a totally different temperament than I do. I feel like sometimes I still react to things as if I were 21. I get very irrational. I get very hot headed. But you tend to just let things roll off your shoulders. And whether or not that's really the case, and maybe you are really angry about it inside, you just won't tell me. <laughs> But I think a lot of us wish we could do that, especially when we know there are people out there who have kind of wronged us. And is that always the way you've been? Or is that just something that you just had to learn as you got older? No, it's probably more 
the way I've always been. There, there are a couple exceptions. Like when I play hockey, I still sometimes let that competitiveness or uh, anger come out a little bit if I let in a lot of goals. Um, or with tennis, uh, when I would play tennis with my friend Tennis Richard, occasionally I would get angry and I can remember one time breaking my glasses because I had lost a match where I was up two sets to love and it was like 1030 at night and we were playing and I just let out this tirade after I had lost. Um, so stuff like that, my day job, I get very angry with certain people, but that's more of because of the way I've been treated as a retail worker, a customer service worker for 20 years. I don't work retail anymore, but I still am in the customer service business, I suppose, with what I do now. Um, and when people act as if you were stupid or act as if you were not trying your best or doing what they need you to do from a customer service standpoint, that still gets me angry. Um, so those are exceptions, but most of the time... I kind of feel like unless it's a life or death situation, it's not really worth being so angry about. And as I hit middle age, <laughs> that's probably uh, something that'll continue. I think, I think as you get older, that's something that you tends to change from being very angry about certain things to just kind of, sitting back and not really letting it affect you as much. But I say that now at 41 and probably when I'm 51, I'll think, man, that guy who I was at 41 was an idiot. So I think that's just the way, the way it tends to go. Now, do you think you have such a good temperament because you're Canadian? No, there's lots of angry Canadians. Mainly people from Winnipeg. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> that's always your family joke is that like what don't trust people from manitoba or what, what, what was that what is that no that's from working retail we you'd get so many uh manitobans in and manitoba's fine it, there's a certain um uh, what's the word uh shortness or uh the the way that certain people speak um to where it maybe comes off as being rude but it's not intended being rude and i think in in manitoba and, and around winnipeg the original people who settled around there kind of had this sort of short halting way of speaking maybe where it comes off as the word is curt you're being a little curt is that it curt i don't know i just think of this kid i went to school with named curt or there's a kid in the Von Trapp family named Kurt, I think. Maybe it's called Von Trapp then. They got Von Trapped. Von Trapp. I don't even remember what we were talking about. Oh, yes. Manitobans. I only think of them when I used to work at the mall. You always knew someone was from Winnipeg or Manitoba when they would come up to the counter and try to pay for a purchase that was like $10 in all pennies. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Okay, so now I feel like you have a right to talk smack about people from Manitoba because you are Canadian and you were born in Canada. So where exactly in Canada were you born? Uh, I was born in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, but we lived in Calgary. So um, Calgary and Edmonton are rival cities. Um I don't know if anybody follows hockey, but that's a huge hockey rivalry, Calgary and Edmonton. So I'm technically an Edmontonian, but I lived uh, all my life in Canada. I lived in Calgary. It just happened to be where I was born, uh, was Edmonton. So it's kind of, it's probably kind of like a, what's a, what's a good rivalry in the U.S. for state cities like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh type of thing, probably. Angelina Jolie and Jennifer Aniston. Sure. Who would be Jennifer Aniston? Uh, would it be the Flames because Jennifer Aniston's never won an Oscar? Yeah, there you go. Probably. And if you guys heard a loud bang earlier, our cat Amadeus, who we call Baby Num Num, 
likes to knock things over when he's not getting any attention. And the reason why I have to pause for that is because we have four special needs cats. And when we're doing things like we're doing right now, they get very irritated when they're not a part of it. So they will do whatever they can to get our attention. And baby Num Num is no exception. So he is right now getting ushered away by Charles. (laughs) Going back to the topic of hockey, we have started doing something different and a little fun recently. And by we, I mean myself. Last Sunday, you joined a pickup game of hockey and I was able to attend. And I had to sit all by myself in the arena and watch you guys while you had all the fun. I was sitting by my lonesome, so I decided to do some hockey commentating and decided to film a video for your Instagram, which I must say was very popular. And everybody in the world thinks that I should be doing more commentating on your hockey videos. What do you think? Yeah, I think you should do more of those videos. You're really good at doing the videos. Um, I don't know if you could say I was having fun, though, because I was bent over and wheezing the whole time. Let's just stop right there. You were bent over and wheezing. This is going to be the sound bite that I'm going to isolate and give no context to. So what do you say about that? That's true. Bent over and wheezing. Uh, Don't put in there that it was with like 12 other 50-year-old men, though. That might make it worse. There were younger men there, weren't there? Yeah, some some guys were in their probably 20s. There were a couple of women there uh, who were, I think, in their early 20s that were playing. But it was mainly probably 30s, 40s, 50s guys. Now, I have to say, the arena that we go to, there is this kind of, what would you call it? It looks like a lunchroom. And it sits higher above, and there's a corner of windows where you can sit in the warmth and look down and watch the game. Very good seating. And I had dragged a folding chair over to that corner, brought my laptop, tried to get some work done. And what was it? The the caretaker or the guy who does the Zamboni? What what, what do you call that? Like, what, what, what's his title again? It's probably the arena manager. Yeah, so I got to watch him and his dogs run around the arena and his dogs kept pooping everywhere. And he would pick it up but not bleach wipe it. Which, at my shop, behind my counter, I have lots of packets of bleach wipes. And to see fecal matter being on the floor and not wiped up in an arena where kids run around, that was entertaining. But I think he could tell I wasn't impressed because midway through the game, he turned off all the lights on me. So I was sitting in complete darkness watching your hockey match. You should feel really sorry for me. It was scary. Yeah, but it's probably like when you're sitting and you're watching TV with the light on. Once you turn the lights off, you can actually see it better. Yeah, but it was really rude. Yeah, it probably was rude. There wasn't really a point to that. I just wanted everybody to know that someone turned the lights off on me when I was trying to enjoy a game of hockey and talking into a phone, commentating on it. And no one else knew I was doing that, so they thought I was talking to myself. So let, let, let's let just sit on that for a minute. Part of the reason why I love having you at the shop is you give me a fresh set of eyes looking at everything. And as I said earlier, you are the mastermind behind the merchandising for the men's section. And in our men's section, we have men's vintage, we have men's vintage reproductions, gifts, all that jazz. And part of what I love is you have a really great knowledge of menswear. Obviously, you used to work in menswear at Macy's, so your knowledge goes from, you know, modern, accessible, ready-to-wear clothing to vintage and and the fit and measurements. And I find that really helpful because I've been getting a lot of men coming into my shop, looking at vintage, appreciating it, and wanting to know more. And I feel like it's always something I'm trying to learn from you, how you look at clothing a completely different way than how 
I look at clothing, and I've talked about this in previous episodes, where women's clothing in terms of sizing, style cut, it's on a whole other planet in terms of fit, and nothing is measurement-based. Whereas with men's clothing, you go more by the measurements, right? Not just like a standard small, medium, large, extra large. Yeah, men's clothing, uh, now if you look at most things, even like blazers and that are small, medium, large. And that I think is because of the uh, fast fashion type stuff. Um, But it used to be where everything was uh, like basically like a suit size. You'd have your shirt, which would be, you'd have a neck size and you'd have sleeve length. And uh, your pants obviously would have an inseam and a, a, you know, waist as they do now. Um, but it, even sweaters and things like that were, were sized differently. You didn't have really the small, medium and large, uh, like they do now. Uh, but I actually do know how to measure somebody for a dress shirt, which is something that I I don't think they teach people anymore. I, I only knew it because when I started at that store, um, we did suit fittings. And so I would have to help in suit fittings and things like that. Um, so that's why I know how to do that or if I can remember how to do that. Uh, but menswear is different than women's wear just because men's vintage is, is really hard to find. And I don't know if that's because men bought fewer items of clothing or if it was because they um, used it a lot more or wore it a lot more. And so stuff is just worn to, to shreds. Um, but it's really tough to find any decent men's vintage, um, aside from suits, you can find tons of suits You can go anywhere and find suits, but nobody wears suits now. So it's hard to really base your vintage, uh, on suits because it's going to come off as costumey and you won't sell any of them. And that's one of the things I hear a lot from men coming into the shop is just in general, it's hard for men to find good clothing. I mean, you can only have so many blazers, suit jackets, dress pants, but I mean, where are the good t-shirts? I remember when I worked at a boutique, gosh, when I was 18 years old and in college, for men, we had these amazing screen print t-shirts. We had really cool button downs, not just basic stuff that you could probably find at your Sears or JC pennies. And it seems like it's just gotten harder and harder and harder. And especially in Fargo, I mean, in terms of small businesses, I mean, I can count on my hand the number of small businesses that carry men's clothes. And I mean, that's a very small hand count. Why do you think it's so hard to, I mean, again, not just find vintage men's clothing, but just men's clothing in general, that's different, I guess, and not dressy or formal. Well, yeah, it's, it's hard to find. You either find those, uh, you know, stores like Halberstads who are not really my style, um, and kind of lean older, um, or you have the basic stores at the mall that, that are everywhere with clothing that really isn't made all that well for the most part. Um, some of, some of the stuff is there's stuff like the polo Ralph Lauren and stuff like that, that is made pretty well. Um, and you're going to pay, pay a fair price for that, but you really don't have much of a selection and what those stores have are very tip of the iceberg of what, you know, polo Ralph Lauren or, um, any of those nicer, better made brands would have. Um, but there's, I guess my, my vision for what your men's side would be, would be not necessarily you're a vintage store that has some men's. It's being like, this is a men's store that has vintage, but it's first and foremost, you know, the side that is the men's, the sort of half of the store that is men's is men's clothing. And whether that happens to be vintage or happens to be kind of in a area that's new, but um, interesting uh, or, or reproduction, like you have a little bit of now, um, I would like it to be something where it's a men's store and, and 
they don't necessarily differentiate between while it's vintage or it's new. It's just, it's a men's store. You have some vintage, you have some new, um, because there, there aren't any stores. I don't know. What are there? Like maybe two local men's stores and that's it in town. Maybe. Yeah. And that's really sad because men want to buy clothes too. (laughs) And I hear this all the time from guys coming in. They don't understand why women get all the fun. And that it's so hard for them to find something cool that fits their personality. And I I have to ask, though, what is a piece of men's vintage clothing or style that is your favorite and you think every guy should have, period? It's like it should be their holy grail piece. Well, if you're talking about a a sort of a style or aesthetic, um, if you... Google or YouTube Bob Vila from 1982. Anything that he wore in those in those episodes of uh, Bob Vila, what it was called, Home Time or This Old House, that's my style. I like that really early 80s um, stuff that fits well but isn't so skin tight. Like like the pants just fit well. They weren't plastered to your leg like they've been for a few years now. And they weren't super baggy and stuff like happened in the 90s. Um, that's my aesthetic. I, I like, uh, give me a good vest, like a good down vest from the early 80s. I like that. Uh, any of those kind of puffer jackets from back then, even though I don't necessarily like that they're down. Um, but the fact that I guess they were made back then means that a goose won't lose their feathers now for it. Uh, but that's kind of my style um in terms of a piece of clothing that every guy should have uh i guess it depends for me my favorite and this is probably not for every guy um the fila tennis shorts from the late 70s early 80s those are probably my favorite All right, everyone, that concludes the first part of my interview with Sir Charles. And this was a little bit of a long one, but sometimes we just get on really good conversations and have to keep talking about it. And next week's episodes, we are going to conclude this interview, which I hate how this sounds because it sounds really pretentious. (laughs) I'm going to conclude my conversation with Charles next week. And next week's episode is going to be our last episode of the year. While I recharge and kind of get my ducks in a row and come back next year with more actual interviews with people who are not related to me or, well, okay, no, Charles is not related to me. Never. Okay. Scratch that. Ignore what I said. Next year, we're just going to come back with other things. (laughs) So stay tuned next week for the final part of our conversation with Charles. It is also our last episode of the year. And I just want to say thank you. This has been so much fun, and I really can't wait to see what next year brings. But I hope you all have a good rest of your week, and we will see you next Monday. Bye.